Well, you don't need to uh, see my background. I'm an Australian grad, but don't hold it against me. <laughs> and uh, I've travelled around a little bit. And um, I do some work. Um, I, I guess uh, I've got an interest in prostate cancer. I'm going to start off by saying that uh, uh, there is a reasonable proportion of prostate cancer being diagnosed in New Zealand. But for the men who are unfortunate enough to develop advanced prostate cancer, that's probably only about 20-25% of you. So uh, I guess one in you know, four men in this room, unfortunately, uh, might have to come in, you know, see the uh, oncologist at some point in time, but hopefully the rest of you are spared um, off of that. And I guess that's not an insignificant proportion. I mean, when, when I went through med school, and you know, that's you know, sort of nearly 25, 30 years ago now, and I was told that men die with their prostate cancer, and that's not exactly true. And I think that's really important that you know, we don't have a one-size-fits-all. So about 20% develop prostate cancer that has spread and unfortunately um, a lot of these men also have hormone resistant disease I'll come to what CRPC means in a minute and we can't cure you and in that situation we're talking about disease control we're talking about the quality of your life the prolongation of life and I'd like to go through with you the evidence behind it I guess everyone tries to look for something that's going to help them but I have to limit my discussions to where the evidence lies. This is a graph where I guess, you know, some men come in at different aspects of it. If you see the thing on the left-hand side where it talks about tumour volume, unfortunately, I guess, if you have a lot of tumour, uh, you will succumb to it at the end. And men may come through a variety of situations. You have men who don't have any symptoms at all from their prostate cancer, you have some who do. You have done some without any evidence of cancer spread in the body, and some who do. And you have some who are responding very nicely to hormone treatment, and those who have become castration resistant. And unfortunately, there are some who will die from the prostate cancer, or hopefully uh, not prematurely, or you know, dying from something else. I guess we all have to at some point in time. So I guess it's really important that we, you know, identify where the men are and look at what we can do to help them at various parts of the journey. So what CRPC, I, I call it castration-resistant prostate cancer, it's not a very nice word, especially the first word, but that's prostate cancer that's progressed despite the low levels of testosterone, the male hormone in the body. And we previously called it something else. I guess I stand here because um, certainly in Auckland, I, I think the medical oncology team has been quite uh, active in terms of wanting to manage prostate cancer. But I gather from um, a meeting that I went to in May in Wellington that the rest of the country may not be exactly the same. But, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a triad of, of different specialties being involved in managing prostate cancer. You have the urologist, the radiation oncologist. Traditionally, these two teams have been involved. And medical oncology is re relatively new into the system. That's your surgeon with a, with a robot. That's a radiation oncologist with their x-ray beam treatment. And that's your medical oncologist, hopefully, uh, uh, you know, uh, relatively uh, sane. And in the early stage, you get the usual people involved. And I think, unfortunately, in the later stage, you know, um, certainly all over the world and becoming increasingly common is the medical oncologist. It's not just that, it's the whole team. The, the whole team is really important and we rely on everyone to you know, put in, you know, I guess, their, their responsibility and their specialty in terms of managing these patients. So what options have we got in advanced prostate cancer? We have the hormone treatment that you, uh, most of you are familiar with. You have radiation treatment. You have the dreaded chemotherapy, or maybe not as dreaded. We have bone targeting agents. We have some of the new agents that probably with time will not be called new agents anymore because they are part of the standard armamentarium in terms of managing prostate cancer. And you know what I really like and you know put a punt in for is clinical trials where we try to better ourselves all the time. And I guess you know for the patients that unfortunately progress despite all our best efforts, we just make sure that we look after them very well and look after the needs. Radiation treatment is really important, and you know I'm not a radiation oncologist, but in advanced disease, it is important that you know uh, it is directed to the area that is symptomatic and requires you know treatment. And 
And I see that as something that is interposed in between all the other treatments, drug treatments that we have to, to, to manage that patient. And certainly that's what it used to be back in the 1970s and 80s. And it's still very useful uh, to complement what else we do. I won't talk a lot about it. You can see that uh, that's your li linear accelerator and a bone scan at the, at the top and the MRI scan at the bottom where radiation treatment is really useful in managing bone disease. And uh, that's something that you know, uh, we should not forget as medical oncologists. I did this about two years ago. These are all the FDA-approved oncology drugs. And you can see there's a lot of them. And this is the chronology of what we have for prostate cancer. Uh, back to after the war when Huggins discovered that hormone treatment, uh, or rather, you know, I guess uh, castration is very useful in managing prostate cancer. To what we have later on with regards to bone target treatment and chemotherapy, and now the new agents, uh, which are, I guess, what you want to hear about, uh, drugs such as abratrone and enzalutamide. And hopefully, you know, we'll know how better to use this with the passage of time. I, I put this up to remind ourselves that actually it's only in the past six, seven years that there has been a variety of drugs that have come into the the, the, the picture for managing prostate cancer, unlike some other you know, cancers, and I think you know, we should get out of this nihilism period. The hormone therapy, as you know here, you know, uh, from the injections, whether they are with big or small needles, those that are combined with tablets, you may have one or the other or both, and other secondary hormones, which we can try later on. And I guess you know, to be aware that for advanced prostate cancer, these are these are some of the things that go through our minds and our patients' minds when we want to manage that. And not to forget, I mean, patients come up to me and say, why do I want to have chemotherapy? That's awful stuff, you know, I've seen so-and-so, and that's really wrecked, you know, their lives and it hasn't really helped them. I say, well, actually, you need to remember that you do have symptoms from the cancer. The cancer compromises your quality of life. And at some point, you know, if you've got a lot of pain, you're on morphine, and I can improve that, then I've helped you. So uh, to bear in mind that there are side effects from the cancer, not just the treatment. I put this slide up because, um, you know, in, up until about 2009, there wasn't a medical oncology practice for prostate cancer in New Zealand. We do have it now, and I think, you know, I, and I'm quite grateful that that's actually growing. These are the drugs that are available. I put it on the left-hand side, the names of some of the drugs, which you can look through from docetaxel to cipolucil T, cabazitaxel, abratrone, enzalutamide, and um, alpharidin. Now, the names are not important. Uh, I've put in you know, what it actually does in terms of fighting cancer, how it actually does it. It's simplified, but um, I guess we have two options available here. Just so that we can have a little bit of a comparison with Australia, which is, I guess, you know, three hours away from here, that they do have cabazitex or chemotherapy funded, and they do have enzalutamide funded, so, and they have the availability of alpharidin. I, I hope that will improve with time to come uh, for the men of New Zealand. This is a very busy table, and I will walk you through it. I guess from my point of view, if I do prescribe a treatment for our patients, I like to know whether it works. Now, you may look at it and go, what does that all mean? Um, it just means that there is irrefutable evidence that it prolongs men's lives. Now, they may not seem like very long periods, but they are important when you have a cancer that's going to cut short your life. So very quickly running through chemotherapy, it stops cancer cells from dividing uh, correctly. It helps to prolong life by a few months. You've got an immunotherapy that I'm not going to talk a lot about because I think you need to spend a lot of money in the United States to get this. And there are some issues about that, as been shown, to help men. We've got abratrone, which reduces the amount of androgens being produced in the body, including in the cancer cells. Uh, that's the one that's funded, and that's been shown to be effective before and after chemotherapy. You've got enzalutamide, which is like a super bioglutamide, which blocks the androgen receptor from signaling uh, correctly. That's also been shown to improve survival by a few months. And you've got a radioactive uh, substance that can kill cancer cells called radium-223. And that has also been shown to improve survival. So what does that mean? I think we need to compare it and look at that. The magnitude of the benefit parallels that of all the other cancers that we treat. And it is important for these men who unfortunately have a limited life. And it actually has been shown to improve quality of life. 
So I think it's really important to remember to treat them and not to write them off. Does it all make a difference? I think it does. It's really hard to get evidence. But you can see that the red line at the bottom is what used to be predicted before we had any of the other treatments available. And they're currently, uh, I guess, you know, the, the, the outcome uh, from the group in London that I used to work with, that they have, we've actually helped them to live longer. Men in the 1970s, 80s used to live an average of about 12 to 18 months. Now we'd be looking at maybe three to four years. Now this all on average doesn't predict the individual, but I do believe we're making a difference. What else? In the last year or so, we've seen that the chemotherapy has enjoyed a resurgence in terms of using it earlier in patients who have prostate cancer spread right at the beginning of diagnosis when they're just starting the hormone treatment. Now, we used to use this quite, late, you know, quite a bit later on. And I'm sure you can tell from the back of the room that the two lines are separable. This is from the charted trial that shows that patients live longer. And this is from the Stampede trial, which is a, a, a similar trial done in the UK, that these patients do live longer. So using chemotherapy earlier in patients with cancer spread at the very beginning does help them. And it's probably a little bit easier to use it when patients are a little bit more well than when they're less well. So we can actually teach an old dog new tricks. So there are a lot of trials underway to try to improve the situation, especially with these new drugs. And hopefully we will make a bigger difference in the future. I'd like to put a plug on for clinical trials because I'm, you know, uh, 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 I, I, I conduct a few and I, I do believe that the men that I have treated have benefited greatly. Um, um, some of you have attended uh, talks I've given in the past that, you know, the men that I saw two years previously when I went to the lab, when I came out, they were still alive and I was delighted to see that. And I think, you know, from my point of view, I think research plays a very important part. Perhaps if we can identify what drives these cancers to grow, we can actually decide what is the right drug to use for them. So I think from my point of view, certainly in New Zealand, is to actually get the right teams involved in looking after the advanced prostate cancer, and earlier is better than later, because when they're more well, we can help them a little bit more. From your point of view as the patients, at least some of you here, the question is, has this all made a difference for me, and is this right for me? It is indeed a personal choice. And when you see the oncologist, make sure you ask all the right questions and they should certainly have a full discussion with you. So in summary, I hope that I've done a really quick brief run through about the advanced prostate cancer journey and the role of the right teams to, to look after you here. And hopefully you can see that the outcomes are and are continuing to improve. And hopefully we'll see you know, more people benefiting in the future. Thank you very much.